Good day, everyone. My name is Frank Bonero, and I am the manager for Food Applications Group at Hasakawa Micron Powder Systems in Summit, New Jersey. We thank you for attending our webinar entitled Cocoa Press Cake Processing. Please note that today's program will be recorded and posted online within 48 hours. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the question and answer chat box along the right side of your screen. At the conclusion of the program, we will attempt to answer as many questions as possible. If we are unable to answer your questions live, a Hasakawa representative will contact you offline. Hasakawa is a global leader in powder processing equipment and systems with over 1,500 employees worldwide, production facilities in five countries, and 12 technical centers with state-of-the-art research facilities. We encourage customers to visit our facilities where they can partner with us to develop new materials and processes on more than 30 different pilot and production lines for size reduction, classification, mixing, drying, and many other technologies. Hasakawa Micron Powder Systems, founded in 1923 under the name of Pulverizing Machinery, is responsible for Hasakawa's business in North America, serving the food, pharmaceutical, chemical, and minerals industries. We have both chemical and pharmaceutical technical centers and a contract manufacturing facility. Our sister company, Hasakawa Alpine, was founded in 1898, manufacturing grinding equipment for similar industries. Hasakawa Alpine has two main divisions, powder processing and blown film. The powder and particle division produces and sells mills, granulators, classifiers, and other powder application equipment for the mineral and metal, chemical, pharma, and food industries, as well as for recycling applications. At this point, I would like to hand over the presentation to Eric Emmert, the area sales manager for Hasakawa Alpine. Mr. Emmert has been employed at Hasakawa Alpine since 2010. Before this, he worked in different markets as sales, business development manager, and process engineer. He finished his studies in 2000 with a master's in science in process engineering at the University of Kaiserslautern and added an EMBA in marketing in 2008. So Eric, can you please take over the presentation? Thank you, Frank, for your introduction. And I welcome all the other attendees to our presentation about Coco Press Cake Processing. Um, going to the first slide, we're going to talk mainly about the cocoa powder processing in the upper right corner on this slide. But in principle, and as I don't know if some of you um, know about the processing steps in the cocoa um, process, the cocoa powder is actually the end product from a pressing process that removes beforehand the cocoa butter that is used then again in the chocolate manufacturing. Um, in the beginning, the cocoa beans, after certain pre-steps that are done usually in the area where they are harvested, the cocoa beans are broken, the shells are taken off, creating cocoa nips that then again are roasted, sometimes alkalized, and finally ground to a paste form that liquefies at approximately 40 degrees uh, centigrade. This cocoa liquor is further processed and then going into the pressing process, uh, which removes usually the fat content from 45% to approximately 10 to 12% in the cocoa powder. Um, there's two different types of cocoa powder used. The one is the natural cocoa powder with no modifications whatsoever. This has a light brown color, and on the other hand, uh, we have the alkalized cocoa powder that um, where a mild alkali solution is used to raise the pH and uh, change the color and the taste to what is needed in the end. We're talking about today mainly about the pulverization, but in principle, there are other steps involved after pre-cleaning and storage and all that. We're coming to the breaking and winnowing area where you could use um, pulverizing system of some kind. Again, 
the same is true for liquor grinding. Um, I will shortly come back to that in, at the end of the presentation so that we can focus on the pulverization of the press cake. The content you see here, we will um, go over the main two different main type of mills that are or were used for the cocoa cake processing, which are pin mills and which are the air classifier mills. We are going to talk shortly about the milling behavior of the different types of cocoa. Um, then the third point is about the different aspects and solutions that you have with the cocoa processing. And a very short piece about the stabilization of cocoa powder and a bit about other technologies, as I mentioned, and possibilities that can be offered. Coming to the first point and the comparison of the two mills. For in the beginning of the cocoa processing and for decades, pin mills were standard were used as a standard for the grinding of cocoa press cake to cocoa powder. Over the years, the requirements of the industries changed, and um, new requirements for pi finer particle sizes besides other things, made it necessary to change the technology. For approximately the last 10 years, more and more producers switched to, um, the, from pin mills to air classifier mills for reasons we will talk about in a few seconds. Nowadays, the state of the art is the air classifier mill for the uh, press cake milling for, a stand, for the standard let's call it that, um, cocoa with 10 to 12% of fat and without alkalization. It is possible to do the high-fat cocoa and the alkalized one on the air classifier mills, but with a loss in capacity. With the pin mills, what you can see here is a, well, a process drawing of how a standard process for milling with a pin mill looked like. So you have here a hammer mill at the entrance to break the cocoa press cake. From there you go up to a feed metering screw that feeds via metal separator the product into the white chamber pin mill used. The product leaves the mill down here has to be cooled down significantly as the pin mill is in, a, in addition to the already not very cool um, cocoa press cake, in addition uh, creates more heat to that. You have to cool it down. You go into a external classifier to be sure that you have the right top cut for the particle size distribution. Whatever is too big again goes into a cooling screw and back into the pin mill. On the other hand, the product that is fine enough is collected in a dust collector or filter and from there goes into the packaging. The mill used here is a white chamber counter-rotating pin mill, which means that you have on two drives, one on the door side that can be opened and one on the opposite side in the housing. Those two um, pin discs rotate counterclockwise to each other and um, this creates high shear forces that mill the particles quite fine already. The particles, because of centrifugal forces, go to the outside. The white body housing used here is used to avoid the product buildup to, because of the um, high fat content, relatively high fat content. The product leaves the pin mill here at the lower end. With an air classifier mill, the system looks quite different. We're entering the system here at point A via a hopper. Then again, over a feeding screw and a metal detector to avoid things like, uh, well, screws, bolts, whatever could possibly um, come inside the product to enter the mill. 
From there, we dose via rotating airlock into a bypass airstream. For that, you have to look at number eight, which is the fan. The fan sucks the air through the whole system. Air is partly sucked in here, but as this is a closed loop, this is not too much coming from the outside, which makes for less problems with the hygiene. Um, you have an additional air cooler in here to cool the air down to, if needed, around 4 degrees centigrade. Then, as I said, here is the bypass where the main air enters the mill down here and the side stream takes the product with it into the mill for the grinding process, which we will talk about in a few moments. The mill, which you also will see again later, has a classifier already inside the mill, which um, makes it possible to uh, have less equipment than with the pin mill process. The product leaves the mill on the top and enters the filter dust collector again. The product then can directly be packed or, which is more common, you have a stabilization process afterwards. If you would like to compare the two systems, um, you have on the one hand, on the plus side for the pin mill, the low airflow as compared to the air classifier mill. But a pressure shock resistant system, which is necessary or, well, at least in Europe is required for cocoa press cake, um, is not available for big sizes. You cannot re uh, produce the finance which is required today, at least not with the same safe security than with the air classifier mills. The jacket pipe cooler shown before is uh, sorry, um, is not that easy to clean. You can see it's quite a lot of bows and um, quite a lot uh, length of tube that has to be cleaned from time to time or quite regularly. Um, this, well, relates to the hygienic problems that can be created. Um, and which is also difficult, not only in regard to the pressure shock resistance against explosions, but also in regard to uh, fires, is that pins can break off of the grinding disc because of wear. And usually they take several other pins with them. And um, those broken pins get hot and then can create a fire inside the mill or rather inside the filter if small pieces that are that have been heated up um, enter the filter. For air classifier mill, the on the plus side we can easily create product with 99.7 or even more is possible uh, percent below 75 micron, which is about 200 mesh. And this has a very defined top size without any stray particles above. The cooling that you need to cool down the press cake and cool down the additional heat you create in your milling process is realized by two cooling circuits. The one is done by the cooled air that I mentioned, and the other is that you can cool the mill housing directly. Therefore, you get less product buildup and you create a longer cleaning interval. Um, as it's a closed loop system, you, in very short time, have a um, water or humidity-free air inside your system, so you get no condensation. And the closed loop lowers the problems with the hygienic air. On the negative side, um, you have a relatively high airflow, which is the principle of the mill, and you have more space required for the filter as it uses a lot of air. This is a drawing of an air classifier mill. The main air enters the mill below the grinding disc, with, which is here. The product over the bypass enters above the grinding disc. You have here 
with hammers the <clears throat> the, um, the rotor that crushes the particles coming in for the first time. They are then sped up and hit the liner where they are crushed again, creating the small particles. We have here at um, number three, the shroud ring, which directs the air and particle stream along this turnaround area directly in front of the classifier shown here. In front of the classifier, you define by the airstream passing through the classifier through, because of the particle size and because of the speed of the classifier rotating, the particle size that passes through and goes out as a product. Both the rotor disk and the classifier disk can be adjusted during the process, so that makes it variable and easy to handle and adjust. To give you an impression, this here is an air classifier mill model 200, which is actually the so far biggest um, cocoa press cake mill that has been built. This mill has been able to mill roughly six, uh, six tons of cocoa at 12% fat content. And as you can see, with a higher fat content, it's just half of that, so approximately three tons. And you reached a 99.7% below 75 micron or 200 mesh. To give you an impression of the size, for one, on the one hand, the Model 200 tells you that the main motor, shown here, has 200 horsepower. And, well, the other thing is, if you look at it, um, it is pressure shock resistant design. This explains all those screws and bolts up here to make sure that it's uh, at an explosion, the explosion can't um, leave the mill. And again, for the dimensions of the mill, if you take out the shroud ring here and you put a plate on the classifier, you can easily open up a poke around here. Um, well, to, to, to directly answer the first question I see down there, yeah, it's six tons per hour that we can produce. Well, I skip over these to uh, go to the more interesting parts behind. This is just a drawing uh, of a smaller mill. This would have been an ACM 75 that uh, was built. You can get the size of the filter because the dimension here is approximately 8 meters. This is the top view of the same mill. And this is a picture of the mill you just saw the drawings of. Um, we would have liked to show you a better picture of such a mill, but as you can imagine, because of the size uh, and inside the building, it's quite difficult to get the whole system on a picture. We're coming now to the milling behavior of the different cocoa qualities. Um, you have we talked about the 12% fat content cocoa already, which gives you for an ACM 75 around 1,500 kilograms per hour. Um, this is sticky, but not that much, and it's abrasive because of the shell content in the product. If you then go to the fat content up to 26%, it gets not only sticky, it gets very sticky, and you need to cool down a lot more than you do with the normal process. And you, but you still can reach the 99.7% below 75 micron. And as we can see later on um, a picture of a particle size distribution, you can reach 50% below 10 micron. But because of the higher fat content, the higher um, tendency to uh, create buildups, you have to lower the capacity. So you just reach approximately half of what you had for the 12% fat content. Similar is true for the highly alkalized one. Um, the highly alkalized one has also 12% fat, but is as sticky, if probably not a bit more, than is the high-fat cocoa. 
therefore you reach a similar capacity and um, but still the same finances. We had all three of those already in our technical facility here in Cologne at an, with an, milled with an ACM 10 and one has to admit the dark powder, the highly alkalized one and the high fat content one are a, quite a bit more difficult to mill than is the 12% cocoa. Well, one of the differences to the pin mill, one of the differences to the pin mill is um, that you have more possibilities to adjust with the pin mill. It's mainly the speed of the two counter rotating um, grinding discs. For an air classifying mill, you have the possibility with different set of grinding tools or in general tools inside the mill with the speed of the rotor the speed of the classifier and the airflow volume to adjust to finer or coarser particles. So with an increased rotor speed, you create more impact on the particles, they crush more and therefore you create finer particles. With a higher airflow, bigger particles are swept through the classifier, therefore you can create coarser particles, but also more capacity. On the other hand, with a higher higher speed of the classifier, again, you can turn away more particles that fall down and are milled again, and therefore you can, again, find the particles. With all that, you can play and adjust according to your product and adjust according to your process. This is a typical particle size distribution for a cocoa press cake with 12% of fat. Um, this is done on a laser analyzing system, but also mentioned down here is the analysis with an air jet sieve, which gives you 99% below the 75 micron, which is a standard value by all cocoa, cocoa press cake uh, processors. Um, I, we added that here in addition as you can see the laser analyzing system gives you just the 73 micron, not the 75, but the results are similar. And um, here you can see the D50, so 50% 50 of all particles are below, in that case, 9.9 .9 micron. This is quite a lot finer than what you usually have on a pin mill. Now a bit about the technical aspects and solutions. Um, in regard to the closed loop system as compared to the open system used for, well, you could use it also for an air classifying mill, but used for the pin mill, you would need to have a HEPA filter up front to make sure that no contaminations from the outside enter your process. You also have here a, a safety filter up front and a filter in front of the fan, but the air volumes that need to be handled by the filter are quite a lot lower because your, proce your process air is turning in circles all of the time. The other point is the energy consumption, as in that case, if you suck in air from the outside, let's assume you have 30 degrees outside, you always have to cool down from 30 degrees to 4 degrees. And in that case, as soon as your system is cooled down, you just have to um, reduce the energy mainly from the milling on the one hand and from the fan on the other, which is definitely more energy efficient than the through air version. Explosion protection is the next thing. Um, this is quite difficult to handle because, at least in Europe, um, cocoa press cake powder is assumed to be explosive. To our knowledge, there have not been much, if at all, any explosions due to cocoa uh, powder. We know that it burns, and we haven't heard of an explosion yet. But as it is necessary to have it in Europe, according to uh, regulations, the, most of the systems in Europe and also some in Asia need to be pressure shock resistant. This is the PSR up to 11 bars. 
including, in that case, explosion barrier valves that avoid that if an explosion happens inside the mill or inside the filter, that the flame front and explosion can leave the system, which in that case would be at the fan or at the entrance. All of the system is built so that it can withstand an explosion with a pressure up to 11 bar. So the mill is designed to the same, as is the ductwork, as is everything that is in between the two barrier valves and the two rotating airlocks, which are flame-proof and are also pressure shock resistant. The other possibility is that you use nitrogen. If you reduce the amount of oxygen to below approximately 8%, then you're on the safe side and no explosions will occur. This has a certain, um, well, has something to it because you don't need to have so big, or so thick wall thicknesses in your equipment and you don't need to have a barrier valve. But um, on this page you see a comparison between the usage of nitrogen a non-PSR system and a PSR system where the PSR system is seen as the standard. Well, for sure investment and running costs can change if it's the standard, but you can have issues. One is that the explosion barrier valves tend to shut down as they react to the speed of the airflow inside them. So during startup, if your fan is running a bit higher without the product than it usually would be, that's the chances that your barrier valve shut down unnecessarily, but that can be dealt with. You have higher investment costs as you, as you have, well, more metal because of the bigger wall thickness and you have explosion barrier valves that you need to pay for and it doesn't give you any protection against fire. Compared to the non-PSR, you save on the investment costs because you have no barrier valves you have smaller wall thicknesses and therefore you have less investment. I have to add, this is true for the smaller mills. It isn't true anymore for the bigger mills because of transporting and erecting a filter with, as you could see, even at an ACM 75, 8 meter height, you need a certain wall thickness so that it doesn't bend on itself during transport. The same is true for the ductwork. Running costs, for sure there's no difference. It isn't allowed in the European Union. Well, it is allowed if you have a fire suppression system installed and it doesn't give you any protection against fire. Now, nitrogen, or in principle also CO2, could be a good solution. What you need is a nitrogen generator on the investment side, including a pressure vessel so that you can faster fill the mill or the milling system. You need additional oxygen sensors and other control add-ons. You don't need any more, again, the barrier valves, and again, you have the smaller wall thickness. You create additional running costs. The N2 generator uses pressurized air at six to eight bars. And the volume you use is very much depending on um, how often the machine is opened for cleaning and maintenance. Issues are, in that case, so far we know only um, of the usage of nitrogen for smaller mills. You need additional time for filling and emptying the system. For bigger mills, we estimated that you will need an additional 1.5 hours for the filling or for the emptying because you have to empty your system before you start to clean the, the filter because you don't want to go your operators um, enter the filter before it's free of nitrogen. Also because of that, you have a potential danger for the operators if you have a leakage at some point you flood the surrounding area with nitrogen, so you need a certain redundancy of your measurement systems, especially in regard to oxygen content, not only inside the mill, but preferably also outside the mill. There is a potential for suppressing fires, because with less oxygen, there shouldn't be that much of a fire, but 
again here the chances could be that if you have a hot spot or a smoldering fire at a let's say in the filter and you open up the the system for whatever reason and you flood the system again with oxygen the fire could start up again and that could create problems if there's an influence on aroma we don't know and uh, so far haven't found anybody that could tell us for sure and just to make the point because it comes up from time to time using nitrogen doesn't make the system more sterile you have nitrifying bacteria too and they would like to have it just in pure nitrogen coming to wear and tear there are certain possibilities to avoid the wear due to the cocoa press cake milling, which is quite extensive. Um, there, are, there is a possibility for cast liners, segmented or in one piece. Um, those have a 10 times longer lifetime as compared to the mild steel or stainless steel version. And it's possible to replace the, um, these in old ACMs air classifier mills. There is a wear bush at the product inlet, which is directly where the product is going through the housing of the mill. You put a duct, which is wear resistant in there, or a piece of a tube, which is wear resistant in there, because otherwise you start wearing on your mill chamber, on your housing, and that's the least, the last thing you would like to have. Um, again, this can be from alloy steel or chilled cast, depending. You have the possibility to protect your grinding disc, which for sure will have, together with the liner, most of the wear. Um, there's a possibility for hard metal plated hammers or full block. You will see a picture of that on the next slide. And also of an additional wear disc made of alloy steel to avoid that you have to replace at a certain point your whole disc in that case, you just have to replace the wear disc. Also, for the cover, the turnaround area I showed before, it's possible to avoid the wear with an inlay. Um, on the picture, you can see a rotor disc with the wear protection partly included. You see the hard metal plated hammers. Also here, this darker colored piece is the hard metal which is welded onto or plated onto the mild steel holder. Um, you see here this is which you can also detect if you look at the different colors up front. The upper part is the wear disc made of alloy steel which is on top of the uh, grinding disc. So you will have wear here, you will create wear patterns here on your grinding disc and you just need to replace that instead of replacing the whole grinding disc. Besides those hard metal plated versions, there are also full block hammers available from cast or sintered hard metal, which again have a longer lifetime than the plated ones or the mild steel ones. On the other hand, they are a bit more expensive. For that, there is a new solution out there where a patent is pending. Um, for people that mill cocoa, it's sometimes um, not imaginable that there are products out there that are even worse in regard to wear than is the cocoa, but there is, and it's tobacco, tobacco leaves. Um, the wear there is even, yeah, a lot worse than for the cocoa press cake. We have first tests done also with cocoa, but the main experience is from tobacco. Um, these new grinding blocks uh, differ insofar that the center block won't be replaced, just the outer wear plates are changed, which makes it a lot cheaper than replacing the whole thing, which gives you a good price performance ratio. Coming to, well, the stickiness and the buildups of the product. There is work being done on the new on a new cover design. As you could see on the picture of the 18200, and I just go back to that. Um, here the cover has been swiveled to the side. This is, in our opinion, not 
optimal as you have to clean the cover from below and all that you take out of the cover falls to the floor. You have to collect it. You have to take it away. And uh, whoever is the poor operator doing that is standing in a rain of cocoa powder. For that, we... If I find it again... Okay. Um, for that, we have created a new cover made from alumina, the part that is not in contact with the product for sure, which is more lightweight, and as it swivels upwards and not to the side anymore, um, it makes for easier cleaning, easier maintenance, and we also added a new wear inlay that uh, lowers the problem with the wear. There are some other general developments where we're working on, always looking for partners to work on. The one is um, <clears throat> we were looking for solutions so that the cocoa powder doesn't stick to the grinding tools anymore. Uh, there's tests and research done to find new materials that avoid the buildup inside the mill and which are safe for food applications, which is quite a problem. Um, as example, we are evaluating possibilities to use not in the area where it's impact, but in the area where you have a wear because of erosion um, with coated so surfaces so that less material sticks to the surface and you have less buildup. Well, as I mentioned before, um, a short excourse to the stabilization, crystallization. Our experience is that, um, well, if you ask seven customers, you get at least seven different answers what they prefer for stabilization or crystallization. There is a possibility to use a pipe cooler, similar to the one you have seen in the pin mills. Um, there are screw heat exchangers. You can just put it in your package and cool it slowly down in the warehouse. Um, there are fluidized bed coolers out there, there are drum coolers out there, and well, we're working on that. Um, there's also the possibility perhaps to mill inside the classifying mill system. Coming to the last point, well, cocoa is a natural product and therefore it's not that well, uniform in its behavior. This creates quite a lot of issues. As you have seen before, different types of cocoa produ produce different qualities. But even if you have 12% cocoa from different sources, they show different behavior in the processing. Therefore, we always um, would like to do trials up front. Even if, um, and it's also good for the customers, even if they are not intend to buy a new mill, but would like to try something at a smaller scale that can be upscaled to their existing mill, we have the possibilities to do, to do trials in our technical facilities. On the average, we do four to six trials from two to a week, um, two days to a week every year for different kinds of tests. And just just give you a short impression on what is done at the moment. We've done trials with processing with liquid nitrogen and frozen CO2. We've done um, processing with the highly alkalized cocoa press cake. We have milled cocoa shells on a hammer mill and on an ACM. It is abrasive, yeah, the pure shells, but it is possible and it's also possible to mill to the to the same fineness as for the cocoa press cake. We were processing mixtures, so cocoa powder mixed with milk, sugar, whatever else. And we have the possibilities to mill with different toolings because all of them, which are probably not available for a customer because he just usually has one certain set of tooling. Um, we have different grinding tools which more or less hammers and different type of hammers or pins. Uh, we have different sets of liners, smooth 
grooved, whatever, and different shroudings with different designs and so on. So it's always a good idea to do a test from time to time to see if there's not an opportunity to improve on the process you have. As I mentioned before, um, cocoa processing is not just the mill I was talking about. Oops, there it is. Um, but also, you can do some mixing or blending. You can do that afterwards. You can do that with the with the um, the chocolate later or the, the powder for the chocolate later on. But also up front, there is blending done. You have alkalization. This can also be done in um, a mixer. And this can be seen on the slide I just was on. This it is. Um, in that case, you have a conical screw mixer from relatively tiny sizes with 5 liters up to the big one with 70,000 liters. Um, in the screw mixer, this screw is turning on itself and in addition is turning around in the conus. Um, you can use that for the before mentioned alkalizing. You can mention uh, you can use it for uh, other mixing. Um, this mixer gives you quite gentle mixing because you can adjust this speed and the speed of the turning here. It can be used for different applications. It can be used for wet or dry cleaning. Um, as you could see, scale up factor is quite big. Um, batch sizes, you can fit it to 20% or you can fit it to 100%. And um, also the, the discharge valve enables you here at the bottom to empty the whole mixer. There's other things um, out there where, where you could see we're talking about the possibility of a hammer mill that can be used for the liquoring process. It can be used for the breaking process of the beans for milling of, co uh, of cocoa shell, but I also have seen it um, used for the milling of chocolate, for the rework of chocolate to mill down uh, almonds and nuts that are in the rework. You could use an agitated ball mill for the liquoring process. And if you would like to go to a very fine scale of your product, even finer than what an air classifier mill can do, you could use a fluidized bare jet mill for ultra-fine powders. I think this, yes, ends my part of the presentation. Uh, thank you for listening to me go on about the cocoa processing, and I would like to give back to Frank. Thank you, Eric. Um, we'll now start with a question and answer session, and please note that if we're unable to answer your question online today, a Hasekawa representative will respond offline shortly. Um, Eric, uh, one of the initial questions, and there are a number of them coming in, regards to the temperature and, say, temperature profile, and maybe if I preface this as far as um, uh, there's a couple of prong questions as far as temperature profile with the inlet versus outlet temperature relationship on ACM mills versus pin mills, and also mm -hmm. comment on maybe the material itself. Is there an impact or influence on an alkalized product and a non-alkalized product? Um, yeah, well, coming to the last part of the question, um, I can't tell for sure if, this, if there's a difference between on temperature between the natural or the alkalized powder um, as um, when I see the powder, it's quite often in our technical facility, and there it's not the cocoa press cake coming more or less fresh from the press, but it's well, it has been transported, so it has it is at room temperature. Um, but from a processing standpoint, the natural cocoa powder is relatively easy to mill at the temperatures I mentioned with the four degrees uh, of the airstream. 4 degrees centigrade of the airstream. Uh, with the alkalized powder, this is still difficult to do. The alkalized one tends to be extremely sticky and builds up on 
every corner that there is. Uh, as an example, we even could see a difference in buildup in the product duct um, in regard to milling in the morning, where we had roughly 8 degrees centigrade outside and milling in the afternoon where we had 16 degrees outside. With the alkalized powder, this made a big difference in buildup in the product duct, but the natural, it didn't. Um, comparing temperatures of pin mill and ACM, um, well, for the inlet temperature, this depends very much on the process up front and how the customer handles that. Uh, the fresh press cake, as, as far as I know, is around 85 degrees. Until it's in the mill, you're probably at 60. Um, some customers use a buffer, so you the mill reach uh, the mill um, the product reaches the mill with 45 degrees centigrade. If it's stored longer, it's at 25 or even lower. Um, but you can say that the with the 25 degrees centigrade inlet temperature, you add approximately 15 to 20 degrees in the milling process, um, although you're cooling. Um, if it's that much for the 45 degrees or for the 60 degrees centigrade at the inlet, I don't think so, but I can tell for sure um, as we don't get all the information after we sold the mill, so um, this is from our technical facility know-how. Uh, we got another question, Eric, as far as um, the avoiding, say, the instance where a fire in the grinding system, um, any advantage or any specifications where using the ACM has an advantage in a situation like that? Yeah, for sure. Um, and by the way, I forgot that um, with the pin mills, the, the temperature increase is a lot higher than with, that, with what we have for the um, air classifier mill, as we don't have the cold air stream going through the milling system with the, the pin mill. And this was part of the question. So um, the increase for the pin mill is a lot higher than for the ACM. Um, in regard to preventing fires, yeah, I mean the ACM is um, in the grinding tools. You use hammers and not the pins, and the hammers usually last quite a bit longer than do the pins and don't have the tendency to break off. And even if small bits of or part of a pin breaks off, even that results well. It, it turns around between the two grinding discs the piece gets hit quite often by other pins and therefore heats up. And this usually at some point enters into, well, either the cooling duct or into the um, classifier or finally probably even into the powder collector. And latest there, you will create a smoldering fire at some point. So the ACM clearly has an advantage in regard to fires as compared to the pin mill. Maybe the last question. Yeah, I, I think time-wise allowed here, basically just the last question um, that we can do here during this session. Uh, but basically, we're, uh, the question we had uh, was about uh, all the remedies we have here with temperature. Uh, maybe just comment as far as advantage with the work we've done temperature-wise to basically extending the cleaning process, maybe just mention with regard to buildup um, or confirming that there is a buildup and what we do maybe extends the buildup, uh, extends the duration of the processing time until it's time to clean, uh, maybe give us an indication of how much further we can process compared to other systems. Oh, that is quite difficult um, to answer. Depends as I mentioned in, in the um, presentation, also on the product you have, what its qualities are, the, the inlet temperature. Um, if I look at the, compared to a pin mill, um, well, you have a lot more of equipment that you need to clean for the pin mill. And especially the cleaning of the tube cooler 
is difficult. I mean, I know that the customers out there that have found ingenious ways to make the cleaning of the tube cooler easier, but as compared to cleaning mainly only the mill, it's still a hassle. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Eric, and, and thank you, everyone, for joining our program today. Uh, we hope you found the presentation educational and informative. And as a reminder, if we are unable to answer your question today, a Hasekawa representative will respond offline. Today's program has been recorded and will be posted online within 48 hours. Please feel free to share this program with your colleagues, and thank you again for joining us.